So as Eurozone leaders scramble to solve the debt crisis that some officials, as I said, say they have 10 days left to figure out, finance ministers have been meeting and they agreed to ramp up firepower of the European bailout fund. This is known as the EFSF. But they said they may have to turn to the IMF for more help. Now, also coming out of that meeting, reportedly Italy is at risk of insolvency. Meanwhile, businesses, they're coming up with contingency plans for a possible end of the euro, that's according to the Financial Times, and enter the central banks with their fire hose of dollars to try to put out the fire for now, they hope. The Federal Reserve, the central banks of Canada, England, Japan, the Swiss National Bank, and the European central banks have joined forces to essentially bail out the euro for now. Markets look pretty happy about it today. As for what the central banks are doing, they are lowering dollar swap rates. Now, this gives European banks cheap emergency access to dollars. But what is firing off rounds of cheap money do for the global currency war that my next guest argues we are in? Well, let's find out because we have Jim Rickards in the studio with us. If you haven't read his book, I recommend you go out and buy it and do it now. It's right there. It's Currency Wars, the making of the next global crisis. Uh, and he's here in studio. We are so glad to have you. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Lauren. It's nice to be here. Great. Well, let's just get right to this. Sure. So what do you think? In your view, is this the Federal Reserve bailing out the euro? Well, what they're saying is this is a masterpiece of sort of perception over reality. What they're saying is they'll do whatever it takes. In substance, this wasn't that big a deal. These swap lines have been in place for years. They do have to get renewed periodically. They, have to, they can be increased periodically. There are offsetting rates. So what the Fed did is we're going to make it a little bigger. We're going to make it a little cheaper. But it was more the signal. It said, look, uh, clearly Europe's in distress. Clearly there's a run on the bank in terms of dollars. And the Fed said, we're going to do whatever it takes. So the, 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 the substance of it was fairly small, but the message was huge, which is we'll do this, we'll do more, we'll increase them if we have to, we'll do whatever it takes. And that's why the markets were relieved. And that's why stocks went up. I mean, the stock market loves free money. Yeah, they do love that easy money. But you said something about a run on banks. Yeah. And it's funny because there were some rumors and some speculation in a Forbes article sure. that, hey, was a big European bank, you know, not able to get money last night? Is that why we're seeing this decision from the Fed today? Do you think that there is kind of this quiet run on banks going on that the Federal Reserve and other central banks are trying to do anything to avoid? Well, yes, it's actually been going on since last summer. It was, it was quiet, it was behind the scenes. It's not in anyone's interest to talk about. It. it was slow, but what's happened recently is it, the tempo has picked up, and it's, it's, uh, you see, uh, Deutsche Bank is almost like a central bank unto itself. In other words, the European banks are afraid to lend to each other, but they will lend to Deutsche Bank because that's considered to be the strongest private bank in Europe. And then Deutsche Bank can selectively relend. Their balance sheet and leverage are actually expanding, so they look a little bit like a sort of a quasi uh, central bank. So yes, it's a serious problem. Seri basically, a run on the bank, a run on dollar liabilities. Now they may be able to fund euro liabilities from European insurance companies and European pension funds. But these are dollars, many of which come from money market funds in the U.S. And they're just saying, look, maybe you're OK, but I don't want to find out the hard way. I'm getting my money out. Um, and of course, the ECB cannot print dollars. They right. can print euros. But for them to get dollars, they have to go to the Fed. So they have these swap lines. Now, interesting, from the Fed's point of view, they're looking more and more like a hedge fund. They've got longer maturity, they, uh, uh, U.S. government obligations. They've got more euro-denominated obligations. They're doing it with more and more leverage. So the, the Fed is in a very risky position, probably technically insolvent at this point. In, the Fed is insolvent. Sure. How can the Fed be insolvent? It because can money. well, they have 60 million of capital. Sorry, 60 billion of capital and about three trillion of assets that are legacy assets. If you uh, took the intermediate sector and just mark them to market and, and the mortgages, they've got Bear Stearns assets. If you mark that stuff to market, you know, we don't know for sure because they're non-transparent, but there's a good chance that the losses would be greater than $60 billion, which would wipe out their capital. Now, they're not going to say that. They're not going to put it on their balance sheet, but that, if you marked it to market, I think that's the result you would get. Really interesting. Now, you say that this latest dollar swap announcement is not a big deal. In and, in and of itself, that right. it's more of a continuation, the perception. the perception. But what exactly does this do to the dollar? In the short term, doesn't it put pressure on the dollar? Isn't it bearish on the dollar? Well, it, it's sort of a conundrum. It's a very good question, Lauren, because what the Fed and the Treasury want is a cheap dollar. That's the, the, the key to the currency wars. So we've been trying to cheapen our currency against all the other currencies. And yet, as much as we want a strong euro, the euro still gets in distress. So here, this is sort of a pretty much of an even swap. By making more dollars available in Europe, it actually should help the European banks to support the euro. So it's bad for the dollar 
good, well, when I say bad for the dollar, the dollar is going down, the euro is going up. I've been saying since last summer, the euro is strong and getting stronger. The dollar is getting weaker, but that's what the Fed wants. So you can say it's bad news. I think it's bad news from the, from the national security perspective. I think it's bad for America, but it is what the Fed wants. Okay, so let's, let's stick to this, because if it puts downward pressure on the dollar and you say it's a, a larger continuation of mm -hmm. things, of a policy, it's also playing into your view of a currency war, right? Can you explain how? Well, because um, the, the, we have to have a cheaper dollar. Well, the theory is we want a cheaper dollar to promote our exports. You look at the components of growth, what are they? It's consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. Consumption's flat. People are up to their eyeballs in mortgage debt, student loans, credit cards, et cetera. That's going nowhere. A little bit of investment, but not much. You're not going to invest if there's no one there to buy this stuff. Government spending has hit the wall because of the Tea Party and the deficit ceiling. So what's left? The only driver of growth that you have left is net exports, and the cheapest way to get your net exports going is to cheapen the dollar. That's the theory. So we could sell more Boeing aircraft, Microsoft software, General Electric wind turbines, et cetera. The problem is that your import prices also go up. With a cheap currency, you pay more to buy iPhones or whatever else. So this starts inflation into the United States. It's really picking winners and losers. That's not really the Fed's business, but that's what they're doing. Well, and on the flip side of that, you see China now, which is easing its monetary policy. Uh, what impact does this have on the currency wars? Well, they're shooting back because uh, for, they're shooting back. They're exactly, firing back yes. at the U.S. with this. That's exactly right. For a long time, China maintained a peg. Now, what was happening was the Fed increased the base money from 800 billion to three trillion, almost. <coughs> pardon me, over three years. Now everyone said, "Oh, that's going to cause inflation in the United States." and there were a lot of critics of the Fed. We never saw the inflation in the United States. The, the supporters of the Fed, like Paul Krugman, Paul Krugman were right about that. But the problem is our inflation went to China because China had to print their currency to soak up the dollars to maintain the peg. Now, about uh, a year ago, China kind of threw in the towel and let the yuan appreciate because they had an inflation problem in China. Once they did that, that inflation starts to come back to the United States. So it is coming back here with a lag. So the, this cheap dollar policy is going to be exactly what happened in the 70s. Inflation is going to take off. And of course, the losers in inflation are average Americans, savers, retirees, teachers, firemen, et cetera. The winners are you know, the speculators and the wealthy who can afford to buy gold or fine art or farmland. or They know how to hedge against inflation, but average Americans, it catches them by surprise. So I view it as a kind of theft from average Americans for the benefit of the wealthy. We're being stolen from, Mr. Exactly. Well, exactly. We're well, being stolen from. What happened in the 70s and it's happening, it'll happen again. We're going to see a repeat of history. Now, I just quickly want to ask you because uh, one more question. We don't have a lot of time for it, but sure. because last time we spoke, you were talking about how you see the future of the monetary system right. as a race between gold and SDRs. Correct. With this news that Europe may be going again to the IMF and saying, hey, we need your help, do you see this as maybe the IMF's chance to have a greater role for the SDR in the financial system at this point? I do, and I see it actually as, as an acceleration of that. This is something that you could very clearly see coming, but I expect it over kind of three or four years. It may be as soon as one or two years. Now, just to be clear, in the short run, the IMF has plenty of dollar credit facilities. The, the IMF has set themselves up as a World Bank in 2008, 2009, 2010. They went around the world and got commitments for uh, almost a trillion dollars of committed credit facilities from everybody, Netherlands, Japan, Germany, et cetera. They can draw those down at any time, issue SDR notes. Mm -hmm. So now for the first time, the IMF doesn't just have um, capital and assets. It's got debt. It's going to have a leveraged balance sheet. So it looks more and more like a central bank. And when they mm -hmm. issue SDRs, you're exactly like a central bank because you're issuing currency. So yes, that's happening very quickly. And they're acting like a world central bank. So the IMF is turning into a central bank, and the Federal Reserve is turning into a hedge fund. Everything uh, is morphing. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jim Rickers, I want you to stick around right here. There's so much more I want to get to. I just really quickly want to explain to our viewers and our word of the day what exactly this reserve ratio business is with China.